I'm David Griffin, I'm here today at Derbyshire County Cricket Club and it's the 10th of July 2017. John Shawcroft, born in 1936. John, welcome to uh, our oral history project. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is, I know in previous interviews you've talked about your formative years and the 1940s, 1950s, um, but there was a, a period where Derbyshire had slipped back into the doldrums in the early 70s before kind of regrouping. What, what was that period like? We'd lost some of our great players, hadn't we? What was it like back then in the late 60s, early 70s? Oh yeah, of course we had the 1969 uh, Gillette final, which we lost to Yorkshire. Then in 1970, um, they came very close to actually winning the county championship. I think they had a bit of luck on the side, but um, at one time up to August, they were, they were top and looked like winning it. And then the next four seasons, um, wins were few and far between, as you remember. Sadly. Sadly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I always felt, and, and maybe this is partly due to family connection, because our son was born in 1972. There was pretty a lot of happy days down here in his, his early boyhood and childhood. But I always felt it was good to watch. They, they just couldn't win a match. Um, I remember the match against Sussex in 1972, when at long last they, they, they won, because um, they'd gone through 71, um, having drawn. 90% of the games, yeah. and uh, they'd gone more or less an entire season without winning. I think they won at Blackheath and then beat Sussex down here at Derby. Uh, 73, there was a tremendous battle to avoid the wooden spoon with Nottinghamshire, which Derbyshire finished second from the bottom. So you can see the, the, the bad times. 74, I always felt, was a really dismal year because we, we had Lawrence Rowe, who uh, didn't really come off like, well he didn't, did he? The, the, the expectancy was there, but he didn't score the runs expected. Always looked a quality player, and won the first game against Sussex, and then didn't win again at all. There was an improvement in 1975, but it was the Eddie Barlow years that really transformed the club, one of the greatest figures we've had in the game, a charismatic character, and. Uh, a very fine batsman as well, or slightly past his best. But um, I remember seeing him get 217 at Ilkeston, and uh, again, um, also uh, a day when Mike Hendrick and Colin Tunnicliffe got rid of Middlesex for 54, 54 yeah, 1977. Yeah. And I remember, I've still got the scorecard at home, I've jotted down Hendrick's field, and it was a typical Australian umbrella yeah. field, there wasn't a single player, I don't think, in front of the bat, bat apart from the short legs. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. It must have been rewarding from a, from a perspective of, because Barlow came in, but but then the team that he developed in 76, 7 and 8, that culminated in the Lord's final in 78, it had got players who'd gone through that difficult time, hadn't it? It got yeah. Hendrick and Taylor and Young yeah. Borrington and one or two others, so it must have been rewarding to see those players actually, under a good captain and leader, develop. Yeah, well I think Barlow got the best out of them, didn't mm. he? He made them better than they probably we really were almost like a Brian Clough effect with football. Yeah. In a sense. Yeah. And uh, we had a, a potentially brilliant new ball attack in Mike Hendrick and Alan Ward. Yes. And uh, injuries, of course, and, and Ward's return from Australia in 1970 um, with an injury. Yeah. Jeff Miller came through. Alan Hill developed into a very good, competent open yes. batsman. Yes. Um, what do you think it was that Barlow did? I mean, because everyone's got different opinions and viewpoints. You know, I was staggered by his his charisma and everything, but I was 14 when he arrived. Yeah. You know, so so 12 when he arrived, or yeah, something like. That. So so I saw it from a, a kid's perspective. What what did you, as as a, an adult, see from the sidelines? What what did you could you pick a particular uh, quality or, or thing that stood out? Well, you, you talk to the players, of course, and they've, they've got their own take on it, like uh, Hendrick in particular is very good on, on talking about the Barlow years. <clears throat> but from a, a spectator's point of view, it, it just looked different. Mm. They looked more alive, and uh, um, players were were performing much better. I know it sounds basic. Yeah. Uh, of course, they did develop. I mean, Tony Barrington was coming through, Alan Hill. 
and um, it, uh, Mike Page, yeah. people like that, he got the best out of, didn't he? I always saw it as a con transition almost from, from grey to colour, was how I saw it. That's Derbyshire had been a grey, boring yeah. sort of side to being a dynamic side. Yeah. And of course, although Barlow had gone by 1981, the, the kind of tone had been set, hadn't it, it for what, certainly for somebody like you, who was born in the year Derbyshire had won their only trophy, mm -hmm. and then 45 years later they win their second trophy. Yeah. So yeah, well, you must have some recollections of yeah. that great 1980. Year. Yeah, well, first of all, just to finish off with Barlow, um, the one thing in 1971 to 74, we were bottom three times, next to the bottom once. Mm. Um, we'll talk about a John Player League in a bit, but um, they were very difficult to beat. I think in 71, we probably lost two or three games. So they weren't, I mean, it was only three day matches, of course, weren't they? although we couldn't win a match. Yeah. We went. If we went to easy to beat. Barlow made them into a side that could win matches. And 81 was, I suppose, if you've got to pick one highlight of, of my lifetime, is, um, is the 81 final. I remember Gerald Mortimer once saying, was a similar age to me, that uh, he actually burst into tears yeah. when they won the, the Nat West final. Um, well, I've got a, que a specific question for you. We ask everyone about the 8-1 final. Did you know who'd won? You know, at the end, when everyone yeah, ran onto the pitch, yeah. did you actually know? Because most people it, say they didn't. They didn't quite know. the longest few seconds <laughs> I've ever had at a cricket match. I remember the last ball, yeah. one to tie, and uh, Tunnicliffe and Miller suddenly hurtling down the, the pitch. And there was a moment where you didn't realise what had happened. Yeah. Have we done it? Have we done it? Is it whatever it is? And then the first mem the memory of knowing we'd won was Jeff Miller raising his bat above his head. And I think it's on film anyway. Yeah. And the whole Derbyshire contingent erupting. And yet I got a moment of sympathy because we were sat next to a Northampton supporter with his young son. Yeah. Probably be about nine or ten. And he just burst into tears. Bless him. And at that moment, I, I felt for him. I thought, yeah. well, I've been this nine-year-old, this ten-year-old. I've, yeah. I've experienced a defeat in a Lord's final like that at that age. But yeah. uh, I really felt for the lad. And then, of course, we're in front of the pavilion and uh, the whole place was in uproar. Yeah, it's interesting what you say about the North Ends one because I say it even now that winning matters more to us because of, of who we are. That if you, it's like in football, you know, if Manchester United win, there's almost a certain taking it for granted. But when you're a smaller team, yeah. the victories matter. They seem so much sweeter, don't they? They certainly and do. And a Derbyshire North Ends final back then, you know, neither side was seen as a powerhouse of English cricket. And, no, they weren't. You know, it was a, a, a once in a lifetime, it seemed. It didn't certainly it? was. And of course, they, North Ends had a good side though. Mm. Jeff Cook and Wayne Larkins got after a very good side. Absolutely. They? And Alan Lamb of course, yeah. so far as and so yeah. And Derbyshire did very well to pull it back from that. Yeah. So. I remember the other memory of that game is that the targets don't seem much by today's <laughs> standards. Was it 235 yeah. was it? And uh, I remember Wright and Kirsten's big stand of 120. I remember thinking, as long as these two stay in, we're going to win this match because people were moaning all around, yeah. it's too slow, and this, that, and the other. And I thought, as long as, as Peter Kirsten and John Wright are together, it's ours. And Wright is a six and a four, I think, just before he got out, which raised the scoring rate to something. And then there was a bit of a collapse, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Uh, it was a very, very tense day. A wonderful day. But of course, the, the fact that nothing like it had happened in our lifetimes, I mean, I can't remember 36, obviously. Yeah. Nobody can. I dare say one or two people could have, were alive yes. at that time. Obviously, they could, but uh, it was so special and unique, wasn't it? Absolutely. In that game. So, yeah, there have been other triumphs since. Well, I was just going to ask you, because obviously then, you know, within two years that side had largely broken up mm. and, and the, the Barnet years began, you know, yeah. 13 years of captaincy. And, of course, Kim 
tried um, to kind of emulate what had always been Derbyshire's strength, which was with fast bowlers. Yeah, yeah. But of course, there weren't quite as many coming up from the mines as uh, yeah. as in the past. So although we had some locally produced, like Alan Ward, like Dominic Cook, we also had to go overseas, uh, including to Denmark, to, uh, for fast bowlers. So, <laughs> that, but that was a, it was an entertaining period. Obviously, we'd got a lot of overseas players and, and what have you around. So what the 80s, you look back on as a, a fond period, some great players who were playing for Derbyshire. Oh yeah, uh, I mean, um, Jim Barnett, whatever happened politically within the club, of all the Derbyshire players I've seen, I think he was the most entertaining batsman. Um, possibly leaving out one or two of the overseas, obviously the Kirsten Wright years, mm. but uh, the regular Derbyshire produced, if you like. Donald Carr, probably the most stylish. Yeah. But Kim was absolutely magic I mean uh, memories you've got more memories than me probably of that period but um, uh, I saw him take Caddick apart down here um, Patterson who Graham Gooch said was the only West Indian fastball who ever scared him and yet Kim took a sublime hundred off him at Cooks yeah. Park I think he preferred the faster the better you know the faster <laughs> they came the better yeah. and he was a, a marvellous batsman when he was fully set wasn't he yeah. tremendous player very dynamic captain and I remember his first game as, I think it was his first game as captain was against Kent at Queen's Park and they opened with Mortensen and Holding the fast bowlers and he got this umbrella field yep. was leaking runs galore but they bowled them out I think they got about 400 yep. marvellously entertaining days cricket that was yeah <laughs> And of course, then we had that little golden period, really, where um, partly under Barnett's captaincy and then under Dean Jones, where from about 19, well, from 88, where we got to a Lord's final and lost, but then 1990 won the Sunday League, 91 we finished third in the Championship, 93 won the uh, Bensons, and then 96 finished second in the Championship. So that sort of eight year period, we had players playing for England left, right, and centre. Um, what do you remember about that period? And, and, and it must have made you feel good for Derbyshire well, at yeah. last to be in the, yeah, this yeah. top echelon of English I cricket. I did, um, because uh, th that, apart from the period from, say, 1933 to 37-8, was the best period of Derbyshire yeah. cricket. Um, the uh, the um, 1990 success on Sunday with Kuiper's batting. Record back into that bloke. <laughs> yeah, tremendous stuff. Um, very exciting. And uh, um, the championship in 96, which was, I know Dean Jones was captain, but Barnett was very much part of that mm. side, obviously. And a uh, very strong side, very powerful attack. Malcolm De Freitas caught coming through, wasn't there? And pipped uh, by Leicestershire. Pipped by Leicestershire. You know, how the game's changed in 20 yeah, years, you yeah, know. Yeah, Leicestershire yeah. win it and Derbyshire finish second. Yeah, ironic, isn't it? Yeah. A very strong team. And of course, the overseas players, you, you, we've mentioned Barnett, and Chris Wilkins was the first, wasn't yep. he? Very entertaining batsman. And then, of course, Azra Dean and um, uh, the later players we had coming through as well. Holding and Bishop, obviously, with the two leading quicks. Yeah. Different in styles, but, but great at times to have a Derbyshire opposition not wanting to play Derbyshire because oh, they've got fast bowlers yeah, again. Yeah. Yeah, I remember one story down here, it, it, it relates to the 1989 history I did with the Chris, Christopher Helm series. We had a book signing with his Australian match, and um, Bob Taylor had, had done a, a forward to it, so Bob and I were doing the, the signing, and uh, playing the Australians. <laughs> and I think Ian Bishop was left out of that game, um, and Bob was most of them would this need to check you actually David but I think uh, Bob was most put out that we haven't got a full strength team it might have been Bishop or Devon Malp I can't remember mm. I think it was Bishop and I said to Bob is there any easing off against the Australians in these matches very naive question and Bob looked at me as though amazed yeah you know totally amazed that somebody should suggest that the Australians um, yeah. we should consider 
easing off again. Well, it's interesting. Fred Truman always said the highlight of his career was captain in Yorkshire, Yorkshire to yeah. beat the Australians in '68 at Sheffield. Yeah. Amazing how touring yeah. cricket mattered so much. In, well, I was lucky enough to see Holding at the Oval in 1976 when he took the 40 really? in the Test wow. match, and that was the most sublime exhibition yeah. of fast bowling I've ever seen. Because you look at that team, and Wayne Daniel looked medium pace. Yeah. And he was one of the fastest, most hostile bowlers mm. in the country. Ferocious, wasn't he, Holding at his quickest? Daniel, but Holding was incredible. Slightly past his best yeah. at Derby, of course. Yeah. Never Still some moments, Absolutely weren't Absolutely great bowler. And then if we come really to conclude, I suppose, the, 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 the cricket watching as you, you've moved into your uh, later years and retirement in 21st year, century. Yeah. And uh, I mean, obviously not as much success, but nonetheless, still some interesting players, still a promotion in 2012. Um, who have been the players over the last decade or so, this part of the century that have, have, have you've kind of tipped your cap out and thought, yeah, I like the look of him. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, Dominic Cork. Um, <clears throat> I always thought, again, leaving aside the politics of everything, very fine player. And he, I always thought Cork looked a player. It yes. Was just, you could, some players you look at, they, they're perhaps doing nothing on the, on yeah. the field. Last week against um, Durham, Paul Collingwood, who was in his twilight years, standing at first slip, he was obviously the captain, yeah. without being too demonstrative about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, recent seasons we haven't had as much success and 2016 was the most dismal year we've had for within all of our lifetime. Yeah. One thing I admired about them, they went through whole sessions without taking wickets, but they never seemed to give up. And Wayne Madsen, uh, of course, is a very fine player. And um, Mark Footit, of course, put the fear of God into one of the mm. county batsmen the, the, the year before, great loss. So yeah, Madsen and um, uh, the, the present crop, um, you look at them and think things are better at the moment in 2017. Yeah. That win at Cardiff must have been worth <laughs> a great deal. And just to conclude, John, if we go back over <clears throat> all of your years watching Derbyshire, and I know you've already alluded to, to 81, uh, would, would that be the single most sort of thrilling moment of your cricket watching life, or is it something more, more simple? Or, or what would be your, your one moment that you'd take with you forever as the... Yeah, just yeah. purely from the cricket, and leaving aside family matters and dates yeah. uh, and memory with, with Jill and Stephen, our son. Yeah, 81 was probably the, the highlight. Um, the win over Surrey, when I was, I think I was 16 or 17 at the time, and God, we'd beaten Surrey. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, in a weird sort of way, that 32 for four against Middlesex, it's, yeah. it's a rather strange thing, that, because you, you think, well, disappointment, the weather was vile. And yet, to me, if I've got to sum up Derbyshire cricket, it's Jackson and Gladwin, with the rain dripping off the trees at Queen's Park, dark. The pitch was almost very dark green. Yeah. And but but I think like I me. think moments are okay like that because yeah. I often took to I have a similar memory about playing Glamorgan at Chesterfield and they were five for three after eight overs and holding a Mortensen had, had scarcely let them get a, sing, a, a look in at all and it was just an hour of of, of astonishing theatre as much yeah. as cricket. Good description. You know. yeah. Yeah. John, it's been a pleasure uh, uh, over the years to talk to you about cricket, but it's lovely to get these recollections uh, down for posterity. I'm sure people will enjoy listening to them in the years ahead. Well, Thank you. So David, it's been a pleasure to do it. Thank, Thank you. you very much.